Hello everyone, I'm Ivan Vasconcelos. I'm a senior research scientist at Schlumberger Gold Research in Cambridge in the UK. And uh, in this talk, we're going to discuss particular technology for imaging seismic data that is composed of multiple measurements. Uh, in particular, uh, these measurements are going to be combining pressure data with um, particle velocity or acceleration or displacement data in acoustic media. It's important to remember that reverse time migration is one of the world's leading tools in imaging full wave field data in complex environments. So what we'll do here is as we go back to these data that are composed of pressure and particle velocity or acceleration, we're going to see how we can modify uh, these type of reverse time migration schemes to account for the vector nature of the data. As we'll see in this presentation, if we can account for the vector nature of the data, both on the source side and on the receiver side, then we can accommodate not only primaries as they usually accommodated in conventional migration, but we can also accommodate the so-called ghosts, as well as multiples, depending on how much we know about the model. So let's begin with this image. This is an image that comes from scalar RTM. That means standard reverse time migration from data that comes from a pressure source and is recorded at pressure receivers. In this particular case, uh, there's a free surface present in the model and that generates both multiples and ghosts. But before we imaged the data, we did no deghosting. So there are ghosts on both the source and the receiver side. And you can see these ghosts present in this image. So this is the image from scalar data. However, if we use the image from the full vector data, the full four component data, we go from this image to this image. So this is the full vector acoustic image, and this is the scalar image. In this talk, we will see how we get to these full vector acoustic images, and the take home message of this talk, as we'll see, is that if we use the full vector information contained in the data, then what happens is we'll be able to account for directivity. That means that we'll account for directivity in a finite frequency sense, which will translate into better relative amplitudes in our final images. In addition, because we're using the full vector information in the data, then we'll be performing joint depth imaging of both the ghost fields and the upgoing fields in the 3D sense. In other words, if we can deal with the vector data in this manner, then there's no need to perform the ghosting prior to imaging necessarily. So let's get on it. Before we go on, I'll name these four references. They're by no means exclusive. There are several other pieces of work that contributed uh, to this development. But these are the four main references that I would advise you to take a look at. In the very last reference, um, you'll find the same examples that are contained in this talk, as well as many, as many more details about the theory um, that we're discussing. So throughout this talk, we're going to go through these four uh, main points. So we're going to go through the method uh, that we call so-called source receiver vector acoustic RTM and which we'll see uh, as, short, as a shorthand as VARTM. We'll go through a complex synthetic example that uses the so-called SEAM uh, model. And uh, we'll discuss the value of these four component data for imaging. And then we'll summarize our findings. So beginning with the source receiver vector acoustic method, we'll go through the principles of source receiver reciprocity as they come from the theory of seismic interferometry and Green's theorems. We'll discuss how these theorems allowed this phenomenon of double focusing in imaging. Then we'll go through the different steps of the method, uh, the first of them being vector acoustic wave field extrapolation, and the second of them being the vector acoustic imaging condition. Before we go to any theory, uh, it's important to think of a few important physical principles. So if we look at the so-called vector acoustic data, and by vector acoustic data, I'm in data that are comprised by pressure and particle velocity. And we simply look at the physical units of these fields, and we take a product of these units. So this is what we see in this slide. If we take uh, international physical units for pressure, that's Newton per square meter, and velocity, as in meters per second, if we multiply this, you can see that ultimately what we get is watt per square meter. Now, you may recognize uh, this unit as a unit of power. So that means that over an area, and you can see the picture at the bottom that depicts, say, the surface of the ocean behind a streamer, if we record three component vector fields together with pressure, 
And that means that what we're really measuring is directional power across that surface. Fundamentally, all the results that we'll see here are taking advantage of the physics of directional power that is contained in a four-component measurement. The most important thing that we need to start with is with the definition of an image. There are many ways of defining a seismic image. In this particular case, we're choosing the definition based on scattered fields. So if you look at this picture and pretend that this is the subsurface, imagine that we have um, velocity varying, that's say the white part of the slide, and then we have discontinuities which are indicated by the gray lines that say represent scatterers or reflector interfaces. What we'll do is we'll define an image as the scattered field as zero offset and zero time everywhere inside of the image. This is as if we could put sources and receivers inside of the image at every point. If we make this definition, then it's clear that if we have a point that sits on an interface, as indicated by the red field triangle, that this contribution will be finite as zero offset at zero time. And everywhere else that is away from a scatterer or an interface, then the contribution will tend to zero, and therefore this is a good measure of an image. Moreover, the scattered field, this local scattered field, is proportional to the local jump in medium parameters. So not only is it representative of a structure, it's also representative of an actual quantitative jump in medium properties. Therefore, it is a suitable choice for an image. Do keep in mind that there are other choices, such as those based on the adjoint state method or least squares migration, but those are not the ones that we're discussing today. Now, based on this definition, we can choose to create the image from boundary data because, of course, we have not measured sources and receivers inside of the subsurface. Instead, what we assume is that we surround the medium with sources and receivers. Uh, for every shot, which are indicated by uh, the um, stars that you see in the slide, there are receivers which are indicated by the triangles. Of course, in practice, we can't surround the Earth with sources and receivers, so for the purpose of this talk, all of the examples will come from flat surfaces of sources and receivers that are above our target of interest. For more details, you can look at the references that you see in the slide to see what the effect of truncating these in the surfaces um, have on imaging. Now, given these surfaces, we'll first look at one set of integrals. And the set of integrals corresponds to fixing the source and integrating over receivers. Now, these integrals, as we'll see in a minute, they correspond in practice to the to the so-called step of receiver wave field extrapolation. Now, these are the full integrals containing all of the vector acoustic data for receiver wave field extrapolation. As we can see, there are two contributions uh, to the integral. Uh, the first integral at the top shows data that are pressure to gradient data. So this is a pressure source to say acceleration or particle velocity receivers. The bottom contribution contains a contribution from pressure to pressure data, the usual standard data that we get from, say, streamer seismic data. What is curious about this equation is that you'll see that these are injected uh, in a way that's unlike what we do with usual pressure data. In this case, the pressure to pressure data given by the bottom integral is indexed as a dipole to pressure response. And the pressure to dipole data, which is in the top integral, is injected as a pressure-to-pressure -pressure response. The final wave field combines both of these fields together into a single field that represents the left-hand side of this equation that ultimately gives us the scattered field due to a source at the surface and a receiver in depth, and this is what we call extrapolation. Now let's look at a simple numerical example. In this case, this is the configuration that we have. Our receivers are placed on the dotted red line and our shot, or source, is placed on the green circle. There's a free surface on the top of the model, and the only element that generates any responses coming back from the model is the point scatterer that is the light blue scatterer that you see uh, in the model. As we fire the source, there are four main contributions in the data. As these waves propagate forward in time, the very first contribution is an upgoing arrival at the receivers, which is the direct scattered wave. It passes through the receivers, bounces off the free surface, and then it is recorded as a downgoing wave, which we call the receiver side ghost. The next contribution is the arrival that goes off the source, bounces off the free surface, the scatterer, and then is recorded as an upgoing wave. And we ca call this the first source side ghost. It propagates through the receivers 
and is recorded as then as the downgoing wave, which is called the both source and receiver side ghosts. Now, when we do reverse time extrapolation, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to have to reverse the arrow of time. Now, in these pictures, we're going to see reverse time extrapolation uh, as an anim animation. On your left-hand side, you will see standard extrapolation from standard RTM. On your right-hand side, you'll see vector acoustic extrapolation using the equations we just saw. To understand what happens in extrapolation, let's remember that forward in time, that was the sequence of arrivals that we got, up, down, up, down. When we go backwards in time, then we're going to have to reverse this. An arrival that came as an upgoing arrival will have to go down, and a downgoing arrival will have to go up. So what we should see first is we should see an arrival going up, then one going down, then up and down. So let's see what happens in our actual extrapolation. Remember, on the left-hand side, you're looking at standard extrapolation. On the right-hand side, you're looking at vector acoustic extrapolation. As we march backwards in time, you can see that the way the fields that are recorded on the data are being injected into the model. If we stop at this slide, then you can see that our very first injected arrival on your left-hand side, which is standard extrapolation, is injected both up and down. And that's because pressure data being injected as pressure data has a full directional uh, radiation, which means that every arrival will be injected in all directions, both up and down. But because vector acoustic injection includes that directional power conservation as we discussed, then an arrival that was recorded as a downgoing arrival is first injected up and it only goes up. If we keep going backwards, forward and backwards in time, then we see the same thing happens with the other arrivals. Or second arrival as predicted only goes down on the right, both ways on the left. The next only goes up on the right, both ways on the left. And the next one goes only down on the right and both ways on the left. So the message here, as we keep propagating this through, is that what happens in vector acoustic extrapolation is that we're capable of jointly handling the receiver side ghost and upgoing fields because of the directional power conservation that is enabled by the use of full vector acoustic data. Now let's look at what happens in the imaging condition. In the imaging condition, we have a second set of integrals. Now, in these integrals, they look very similar in form to the extrapolation integrals, but if we look closely, they are in fact different. The first way in which they differ is what's actually in the integrands. So if we look at the fields, the scattered fields that we see in the integrands, they're no longer data. These are the extrapolated fields we just saw in the animation. They're computed from data, but they're not equal to data. Notice that now we have two extrapolated fields. The one in the bottom, which we call receiver wave field 1, comes from monopole sources or pressure sources, but full vector acoustic data on the receiver side. That's the wave field that we just extrapolated. We also need an additional field. This will come from dipole sources on the source side that is recorded by full four component data. Each one of these fields is then cross correlated with what we call a source field. The one on the top, is cross-correlated with a monopole or pressure source wave field. The one at the bottom is cross-correlated with a dipole source field. Now, this gives us the image as we define, which is the local scattered field at zero times zero offset. And that's what we can see by the first line of this equation. Again, for details, I'll reference you to the references that are at the bottom of the slide. Now, let's see what happens when we do imaging. In this case, we use an example with absolutely no free surface. On the left-hand side, you see the images that correspond to standard RTM. On the right-hand side, you, you see the images that correspond to vector acoustic RTM. The, red do, uh, the green dot and the yellow line, again, correspond to the acquisition. There's a single shot, and it's placed at the, red dot, uh, the green dot, and uh, the data are recorded over the yellow line. What you also see here are the red crosshairs, indicating the actual position of the scatterer that we're trying to image. There's also a difference between the top and bottom pictures. The top pictures are made with a wide receiver array that is densely sampled and therefore mimics in two dimensions an inline acquisition in seismic data. The bottom panels are created with a narrow aperture receiver array that is sparsely sampled. In fact, only five receivers are used. You can tell by counting the fringes on the images in the bottom. If we compare the images on left and on the right, you can see that they look very similar. And the reason they do look similar is because there are no free surface contributions that create ghosts. And this is what we expect from the theory. 
Now you can see that along the curves, the amplitude varies. And the amplitude is varying because on the right hand side, the vector data is accounting for directivity better than it does on the, on the left hand side with standard RTM. If we put the free surface back on, then we get these images. In this case, the data had the free surface, but we didn't use the free surface in imaging. What this gives us is a proper imaging of the upgoing arrivals. Now, if you look on the left, you can see that there are several artifacts that are not related to the scatter. And this has to do with the poor handling of the ghosts that cannot be accounted for in standard RTM. This is why we need to do the ghosting in the first place. But if you look on the right hand side, once we use the full vector data, you can see that many of those artifacts have been mitigated. And this has to do with the joint handling of the up and down going fields in vector acoustic injection. You can see that not all of the ghosts are gone, and this has to do uh, with the fact that we're not uh, using all of the sources that we should be integrating over. Now, the message here is that, as we saw, uh, the receiver side ghosts were handled by uh, the vector acoustic extrapolation, whereas here the joint handling of the source side ghost and upgoing feuds are done in the imaging condition. So how do we go about actually using the ghost? If you recall what I just said in the previous slide, I mentioned that the data was recorded with a free surface, but we didn't use the free surface in imaging. And that what that resulted in was in only using the upgoing fields in imaging and the ghost in the source side ghost. But we can actually use the ghost in imaging by taking advantage of the full vector data. So this is the picture I just showed you, and like I said, I didn't use the free surface in the imaging. And this is a picture of the upgoing field. Now, we can do the same for the ghost. And this is an image of the ghost. If I flip backwards and forwards, you can see that there's a substantial Im difference between imaging the upgoing fields and imaging the ghost. Again, if we compare the left-hand side plots with the right-hand side plots, you can see that vector acoustic imaging does a far better job in mitigating the artifacts that are related uh, to the ghosts. Most importantly, if you look on the lower right-hand side corner, right at the crosshairs, then you'll see that there's a slight slope to where the scatter is supposed to be. Now that slope is different between the ghost and the upgoing field. Again, this is the upgoing field and the ghost. This means that if we image everything together, which is this image, you can see that the resolution at the scatter location, again focusing on the lower right-hand side picture, increases because we've combined both the ghost and the upgoing field. This is a big advantage that can be brought on by properly handling uh, these vector fields together with pressure data. You can see on the left hand side of this picture that if we try to image everything together from usual RTM, uh, we'll struggle, especially in the bottom case where the data are sparsely sampled with a narrow aperture array. Now, this example is a synthetic, highly idealized example where the geometry of the acquisition allows for such a gain in resolution, and this might not always be possible with field data. But it does say that we might be able to design our surveys in a way to take advantage of such phenomena. The takeaway message in any case is that in some cases, by combining the ghost and upgoing fields, the image aperture increases and therefore the resolution of the image increases. So now let's look at a different thing. We'll move on and, and we'll look at a more complicated example. This is the example that I showed you to begin with. So we'll look at the seam example where we'll discuss the role of dual fields for both sources and receivers, imaging using the ghost and upgoing fields. We'll also discuss another aspect which is using the internal multiples in the model depending on what we, what we know about the model. So this is the seam uh, portion of the data that we're using. It's a subset of one of the inlines in 2D. Uh, the number of the inline is at the top. Uh, we used several sources. Uh, these are spaced at 150 meters and they're placed at 40 meters depth. Uh, the wavelet used for modeling is a 20 hertz centered Ricker wavelet. The receivers are spaced at 10 meters. Their spread is fixed and they're placed at 75 meters depth. This model is the model where the data is actually generated with all of the interfaces. This is the model that we use for migration where you can see the salt is capped but the sediments are smoothed.
as it is common practice in most migration routines. We'll focus on two zones. One is the salt flank zone. And we'll use this shorthand to indicate what was used to do imaging. The star indicates what was used on the source side. If you see both a circle and the crosses, that means that we use the pressure data represented by the circle and the dipole data represented by the, the crosses on the source side. For the triangle, you'll also see a red circle or the red cross indicating respectively either a pressure receiver or a gradient or dipole receiver, uh, usually in the form of acceleration or particle velocity. This is our first image in the salt flank zone, and this is computed by standard RTM. Again, we did no deghosting in this model, so you can see a strong influence of the ghosts in several places, particularly if you focus close to the salt flanks where you can see the ripples that are caused by both the source and receiver ghosts. If we add the vector data on the receiver side, then we go from this image to this image. Again, standard RTM vector acoustic on the receiver side. And if we add vector acoustic on both source receiver side, we go from this image to this image. So again, standard RTM, receiver only vector acoustic, source and receiver vector acoustic. To appreciate the changes in the image, we'll actually look at this particular plot, which is uh, directly extracted from the model, being an estimate of the impedance contrasts that we're trying to image. We'll put some arrows so you can follow what happens in the images. So this is the vector acoustic image, and you can see in many places uh, that the image is of very high quality. This is a standard RTM image. So standard RTM, vector acoustic. Again, this is not to say that we can't do deghosting very well in field data. Of course we can. But what this says in practice is that once we actually have the full vector information on the data, then we can perform full 3D physically meaningful deghosting directly at imaging stage with no need for pre-processing. Now let's look at a different zone. This is the sediment zone. And again, we'll go through the same exercise. This is the RTM image, vector acoustic receivers, RTM vector acoustic receivers, vector acoustic both on source and receiver side. And we'll go through the three images again. RTM, receivers, sources and receivers, vector acoustic. Again, we'll look at the impedance contrast. We'll place some of the arrows to help us guide our interpretation. This is the full vector acoustic image. This is the RTM image. The message is similar to the one that we saw with the salt flank. If also, if you look at the upper right-hand corner of the picture, you can see that there are some artifacts that are more prominent in standard RTM. And these are artifacts that also exist in the vector acoustic RTM, but their amplitude is toned down by the directivity effects of the vector data. So here they're prominent because the vector data is not present, and here they're less prominent because the vector data actually tones them down. Now, the other thing that we can do is that we can account for internal multiples. I won't go into the details. For that, you can consult the papers that are on the bottom of the slide. But the thing that is important to remember is that the first integral that you see in this equation is the same integral that you saw before for the vector acoustic imaging condition. However, we have a second integral, and the second integral has different terms. In the second integral, we have correlations of receiver wave fields with themselves, or of scattered waves with all their scattered waves in the fields. This is a nonlinear term that's added to the imaging condition as described in the references that you see in the bottom. I won't go into the details as to the physics of this, but I will show you what it does to the images. So this is our standard RTM, assuming linear image. This is the same vector acoustic RTM that I showed you a few minutes ago. If we add the nonlinear term, we go from this image, and then we'll put our reference, we go to this image. So this is the linear image, this is the nonlinear image. You can immediately see, by looking at the solid arrows, that our, amplitude has greatly imp our amplitudes have improved, and particularly so in terms of resolution. So our spatial resolution has improved dramatically. This is an effect of the interaction of the scattered fields with themselves inside of the model. But you can also see in the dotted arrows that some of these artifacts are not really physical. They're related to the fact that our source and receiver arrays 
don't enclose the medium completely. I won't go into the details, but you can check out the references. If we compare it with uh, the nonlinear image from standard RTM, then you can see that in standard RTM and vector acoustic RTM, these images are substantially different. Particularly if you look close to the salt at the arrow, you can see that the structure is in fact wrong by comparing uh, standard RTM to vector acoustic RTM. So when accounting for these multiples and for these nonlinear terms, the vector measurements are even more important. In our final and next bit of analysis, one of the things that we'll see is that one of the advantages of using vector data, and particularly vector acoustic imaging combined with vector data, has to do with realistic acquisitions where our sampling is less than ideal in the sense that we have finite aperture arrays and not necessarily densely sampled sor sources and receivers. To begin that argument, we will um, discuss what happens with narrow aperture data, but we'll particularly focus in the case of no free surface. And we're doing that to take away the ghost effect in this case and just focus on the directivity effects that are brought on by the use of vector data. We'll use different data sets. We're not going to talk about all of them. These are uh, the different acquisition scenarios that you'll find uh, in the reference that I mentioned to you at the beginning of the talk. But we'll first look at this example. So what you see here is you see a narrow aperture array of receivers at the top indicated by the red line. At the center of that array there's a so shot indicated by the um, presence of the star. This is supposed to emulate what a cross-line image would look like in a standard marine survey. Now, what you can see in here is that you see prominent artifacts that are common in RTM, and this is before any artifact filtering. In practice, we filter these artifacts after we stack over shots, but this is important here for us to make our point. If you look below the strong black artifacts, you might be able to see some faint reflectors that are the things that we're actually trying to image. The relative amplitude, however, of these artifacts and the actual reflectors is so that we can pretty much only see the artifacts. If we use vector acoustic data, however, you can still see the artifacts, they're still present, but you can see that the reflectors become far more prominent relative to these artifacts. So please focus just beneath the strong white artifacts that you see in the slide. You can see some reflectors here, whereas they're fainter in standard RTM. So again, RTM, vector acoustic RTM. What's really happening here is that the vector data at the surface, combined with vector acoustic imaging, can handle the finite frequency directivity directly from the data. This translates into the better relative amplitudes that we saw in this particular example. To appreciate this further, let's look at this particular example where we only used 12 shots at the surface. As you can see, this image is not of the same quality as the images that we saw before because there are a few shots and they're sparsely sampled. But the important thing here is to notice that these amplitudes that you see, the relative amplitudes between the reflectors and uh, the artifacts, get worse if we had not used uh, vector data. So this is the vector data. And this is standard RTM. And you can see that this image is dominated by the artifacts, whereas this image has a better amplitude weighting of the artifacts relative to the signal that we're trying to recover from the reflectors. Again, that's RTM. That's vector acoustic RTM. One important thing to remember is, of course, that we're not saying that we can't do anything about these artifacts. In practice, with real RTM, we deal with these artifacts post-imaging. That is possible. But the point here is that the artifacts will be mitigated prior to any filtering if we use vector acoustic RTM. So to finalize, this talk, what we did is we covered a full wave imaging method for four component data using either dual sources or single sources. By dual sources, we mean sources that contain both pressure data as well as gradients on the source side. In vector acoustic imaging, what really happens as input, we use both pressure and particle velocity data. These can be either the total pressure and particle velocity data or, practical, or pressure and particle velocity data after wave field separation, in which case they correspond to up and down going fields. An important thing that comes out of this method is that we can handle finite frequency directivity directly from the data in the imaging procedure. 
On top of it, because of the conservation of power at both the source and receiver surfaces, this jointly uses both the ghost and upgoing fields in the depth domain from 3D data in a physically consistent manner. As well, we saw as well, if we want to try to account for multiples by adding the nonlinear imaging condition to the data, then the gradient data is even far more important in weighting those contributions appropriately. One of the offshoots of this kind of imaging is that we can now think of custom-designed acquisition. Deep towing then becomes more attractive because we can design an acquisition where the ghost data looks different from the upgoing data and therefore take advantage of both of these fields in vector acoustic imaging. Another thing we could do is we can design variable depth acquisition both in inline and crossline geometries to try to maximize the resolution power using both up and down going fields. Finally, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll thank you this individual and I'll thank these individuals and Schlumberger for the opportunity to come and talk to you about this today. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I hope you get to think about this afterwards at home. Thank you.